Hi everyone. In this installment of Programming for Lovers, we will talk about built-in functions in Go that generate sequences of numbers that at least seem random. We will then apply what we learn to write functions that roll dice, preparing ourselves to simulate a casino game. As always, if you enjoy what you see here, please like and subscribe. Plus, join our course to check your work from this code along and unlock tons more content at programmingforlovers.com. Let's code. To get started, you'll notice that I have created a folder called dice within our Go SRC source code directory, and then I've got a file called main.go within that. That's what we're going to edit for the purposes of this code along, and I've got a little bit of starter code for us present already. We're going to start, though, with talking about three functions that are built in for generating pseudo-random numbers in Go. And I will show each of those functions being printed first. All three of the functions are going to require us to import a package. That package is going to be a package that lives inside of the math package. So it's called math slash rand. And then to access functions from that rand package, I'm going to call rand dot whatever the function name is in the same way that I call fmt dot printline, for example. So the three functions that I, I said that we're going to talk about are, and I'm going to print out the result of each one of those, are rand.int. And this is going to print an integer. I'm also going to have a function called rand.intn. And if I, that's going to take as input some integer n. And here I'm going to give it 10. And that's going to print an integer between 0 and 9. You might expect it to print an integer between 1 and 10, but because everything is 0 indexed in Go, it's going to print an integer between 0 and 9 inclusively. And then the third pseudo-random number generating function that we're going to consider is rand.float64. And that generates a pseudo-random floating decimal, but not over all possible decimals. It generates it in the range uh, including 0, but not including 1. It would be very strange if you act, if you generated the number 0 because this is over all floating point decimals in that range. Now I've got some code here, and what I would like to do is just run this code. So I'm going to save what I've done. I'm going to pull up a terminal, if I'm able to. I'm going to pull up a terminal, and I'm going to navigate into this directory. So I'm going to navigate with cd into src slash dice. And then I'm going to compile with go build, and I'm going to run with dice.exe on a Windows machine or dot slash dice on this Mac that I'm running this on. And you'll see that what gets printed is the three things that I specified. Some pseudo-random integer, an integer between 0 and 9 inclusively, and a floating point decimal between 0 and 1. That's all well and good. These three functions are super helpful, and they are actually, as we're going to see, uh, allow us to do some pretty cool things. But I want to do something else before I proceed, which is run this code again. You might wonder, okay, I've got the same code. The idea is that it's supposedly random. It should at least seem random. So when we run the code again, do we see different results? And maybe yes, maybe no. Let's see. The answer here is yes. And that's what you might expect. After all, these numbers are hopefully random, and we might by random chance get the same number again, but as you saw here, we didn't. So we're seeing that something different is happening internally. And one thing I would point out is that for many years of Go, that was not the case. We would run this code and we would get the same output every single time, and that was by design. So you might wonder, why would that be the case? Why is it that if these numbers are seemingly random, you would run the code multiple times and get the exact same output every time that you ran it. There's nothing random about that. And the reason why is that the number generation process going on behind the scenes is not in fact random. It's just seemingly random based off of a given input or starting position. And so for many years, that starting position, that initial number that you would get would be the same. Now it's done in a slightly different way. Let me show you how we can get some control over this and, and illustrate exactly what I'm talking about. So within RAND, we also have one more 
I've got quite a few other functions, but one more function I want to talk about, and that's called the seed function. And ran.seed, you're going to see there it's uh, VS Code is angry at me because there's it's somewhat deprecated as we're going to talk about. But ran.seed will take as input an integer. And based off of what that integer is, it will start the pseudo random number generation process at a given point in time. So if I gave it one, for example, that's just an arbitrary integer value, and that's where we're going to start the process of generating the numbers. As soon as I set that ran.seed equal to one, that tells Go that it's starting the pseudo random number generating process at a particular place. So if I come down into my terminal and I compile this code again after saving and then I run it again, you'll see the, this particular output, okay? And that's different from what we've seen. But this time, if I run the same code once again, I get the same output. And that's because I have seeded or initiated my number generation process at the same point. I can run this however many times that I would like and I get the same result. I could change this to another number, negative 49, okay? And save, compile, I have to hit up a lot to get to go build, compile, and run. And what we see is a different collection of values, but if I run the code multiple times, it's been seeded in the same place. And so the sequence of, of numbers that we're going to get is gonna wind up being the same. This allows you to have control over a process. So if you were testing your code, you would know which numbers that you're actually getting, and that might be helpful to you. And so in fact, for many years, there was an assumption that the number generation process was seeded with ran.seed of one. This used to be the default behavior. That's no longer the case. Um, and so what you would have to do if you tr wanted at least seemingly truly random numbers was that you would have to give ran.seed something that was random. You would have to start ran.seed with a different number every time you ran this code. And the way that you can get at that is to seed based off of the current time. And so you could give it, you'd need the uh, time package, but you'd say, what is the time now? And I'm going to convert that over to nanoseconds because the number of nanoseconds is going very rapidly is turning over all the time. So you would have no risk of really hitting the same value unless it was random chance when you ran this code more than once. Um, and so as a result, you would need to do this in order to get different results. I saved that, it gave me the time packages and import. And then I'm gonna compile this and run my code again. And you're gonna see, here we get a result. And then if I run it again without compiling, I get a different result. And this is because every time the code is run, a different value is getting plugged into ran.seed. And so you're starting your number generation process in a seemingly random position. You used to have to do that, um, but these days you don't have to do this. This is sort of built in automatically and the, the behavior has switched. So if you wanted very predictable results, you have to, have to seed the random number generation process manually Otherwise, you get something that's going to seem random by default, uh, which I think is, is probably what you would want most of the time. Let's practice this and apply it to a real function. So I'm going to write a function that's going to simulate the process of rolling one die. I said that we want to roll some dice here. So let's have a function called roll die and what does it need to take as input? Nothing. But what is it going to take as output? Give as output? It's going to return a pseudo random integer between one and six inclusively because it's simulating the process of rolling a single die. So I'm going to have a function called roll die and it's going to return an integer. And then the idea is how do I get a pseudo random integer between one and six? Well, I've got a function that's going to give us a pseudo random integer between 0 and 5. If I look at, say, x is equal to rand dot int n of 6, x is between 0 and 5. And so I just need to add 1 to that number to get something that's between 
1 and 6. And so let's do that. We're going to say return x plus 1. And that's very deliberate, steady code. You might notice I don't even need the variable x. Um, I've just introduced it there for the sake of the exposition. In practice, you would probably just say, well, I want ran.int n of 6. I want to add 1 to it, and then I want to return that thing. So that's going to allow me to have just this one line function. So we can roll one die. To play games and such, we're probably going to want to roll more than one die. So let's think about how we would write a function called, say, sum two dice. That, again, doesn't take anything as input, but that as output uh, generates simulated sum of two dice. And so this is going to be between 2 and 12. 2 is the smallest number that you could obtain if you get two ones. 12 is the largest number you could obtain if you have two sixes. And so my function is going to be called uh, sum two dice. It's not going to take any inputs. It's going to return an integer. And there are a couple different ways of getting at this. One of the things that you might do is think about what the probability is of each particular value that you roll coming up. You, the value that you could roll coming up. So you have everything between 2 and 12, but they have different probabilities. And we could do a little bit of mathematics and see that the probability of rolling a 2 is 1 out of 36, the probability of rolling a 3 is 2 out of 36, and that's the same as the probability of an 11. The probability of rolling a 4 is 3 out of 36, and that's the same as the probability of a 10, and so forth. And we could translate that into a function. We could say, well, how is it that I would divide up all those probabilities? This is a classic example of when you have some process and you're, you're generating something according to a probability, then that probability, all those probabilities probably sum to 1. And so I could have a random variable called roll that I generate as a floating point decimal between 0 and 1. And then I could divide up that interval from 0 to 1 into different sized buckets. And based off of where that value falls, the size of the bucket would correspond to the probability of the event that I'm interested in. So for example, if I'm thinking about rolling two dice, the probability that the sum is 2 needs to fall in a window whose width is 1 over 36, whose width is equal to that probability. So I might say if roll is, say, between 0 and uh, 1 36th, then in that case, I would return 2 as the value of the sum of the dice. And then I need to say, okay, well, the probability of getting a 3 as the sum of the two dice is 2 out of 36. And so maybe I would have else if roll is less than, and it's tempting to do 2.0 over 36.0. However, you want to think about the likelihood of falling in this interval, and the interval itself needs to be have width 2 over 36. So I, because I've excluded the case that roll is less than 1 over 36, I need to increase this to 3 out of 36. So this case is really checking, you know, we know that roll is bigger than 1 36th if we're here. Um, and in that case, we would return a 3. And then I'll just write one more. We need an interval of width 3 out of 36. So if it's less than 6.0 over 36.0, which is actually just a sixth, um, then I'm going to return 4. And I'm just going to say etc. because this approach has this nice mathematical finality to it, but what it lacks is simplicity and it also lacks generalizability because I want you to imagine what happens next when I want to sum three dice or sum four dice and I'm going to have to write individual functions for that. And it might be a fun mathematical exercise, but these are going to be really long if else ifs and I'm going to have to do a lot of math. And the fortunate thing is that we're studying computer science, not mathematics. And in computer science, you can be rewarded for being lazy very often. Often, you can be rewarded very handsomely, as we're finding out in the tech era. However, that aside, let's use that laziness to our advantage. 
So I don't need a function that's going to break this up and solve everything out probabilistically. And the reason why is that this function can rely on the fact that I already can roll a single die. So I already know have a function roll die that's going to simulate the process of one die. And I could call that function two times. So if I said roll die, that's going to give me one die roll between one and six. And really, I want to add that to another die roll between one and six. And that's what I want to return. There's a longer way of writing this function to say roll one colon equal roll die, roll two colon equal roll die, and then return roll one plus roll two. I'm not going to do that here. I'm just going to simplify this down to one line. So we could have this nice mathematical function, or we could just rely on the subroutine that we've already written. We're going to see throughout this course, this is yet another example of subroutines and writing multiple functions coming to our rescue. Better yet, we're even able to generalize this function a little bit further. And I, I can go ahead and write a separate function here. So the separate function I'm going to have is some dice. And now it's going to take as input an integer, uh, which is the number of dice that we want to roll. And the output is going to be the sum of num dice simulated dice. As I should say what some dice does, some dice simulates the process of summing n dice. Okay. So our function is going to be called sum dice. And it's going to take num dice as an integer, and it's going to return the sum of the dice after rolling num dice simulated dice. Let me declare my sum variable to be equal to zero. That's what eventually I'm going to return. And now we're just going to have a for loop. So that for loop is going to range over num dice possibilities. So this should be getting really comfortable to us now. We're going to have some variable I'll call it i, ranging from zero up to, but not including num dice. I'm going to increase i every time through the for loop. And then as I go through this, I'm simply going to have a single roll. And I'm going to add that result to my growing sum. One more instance of the case where I don't actually technically need this intermediate variable roll. I can instead uh, call roll die and add it into my sum, as you see there. OK, great. Let me just show you this process in main before we continue. And oops, went to the bottom. Just show it to you. So let's say roll dice of two. And I think I called it sum dice. So I'm going to sum two dice. And I'm going to go in my terminal. I'm going to compile my code. And then I'm going to run my code. And after I see my three integer integer between 0 and ten, 9, and then float 64, I see some dice. So I could run this again, and I get 3 the first roll, 10 the next roll, 6 the next roll, 12, 6, and so on. So I have a little bit of faith that I'm simulating this dice rolling process correctly, and I'm ready to go. So that's great. We can roll dice. And you're probably curious, what's next? Well, let's take this process of being able to roll dice and use it to simulate a real dice game. And then we're going to figure out how much, on average, in the long term, we would win or actually lose playing this game that we're going to simulate. To do that, you're just going to have to join me in the next code along. And so I'll see you there. Happy coding.